Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Pharma Future, our speaker partner, MST India and Indogene, we're very pleased to uh, invite you to this expert session. Uh, as part of Pharma Future this year, we're hosting a series of uh, expert sessions that highlight and discuss key mega trends in the industry. Our first session is around the corporatization of healthcare. Uh, we're joined today by Ms. Monica Chaudhary from MSC India. Monica is responsible for MSC India's business, vaccines business. Um, she's also responsible for women's health and business support. Monica has tremendous experience in the US as well as in India and in several global roles. Um, the agenda for today will be to cover the Indian healthcare sector, the evolution of corporatization, industry drivers, current adoption of corporatization, and of course, the impact on stakeholders. Monica will contrast her vast experience in the US and in other roles in different geographies against what we're seeing here in India and make inferences as to where this industry and how this is going to impact stakeholders here. Uh, I'm going to take a second to talk about logistics before we get started. On the bottom left of your screen, you should see a Q&A box. Participants can enter questions to ask Ms. Chaudhary anytime during the session. All you need to do is type in your response, type in your question, and then we will get a, a response here. At the time when we reach the Q&A part of the session, we will talk, we we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. If we are unable to do that, then we'll definitely respond back as soon as possible once the session is over. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Monica Chaudhary. Monica, do you want to uh, give a brief description about Sir. what you've been doing? Certainly. So, Kiran, thank you for having me. And as back to as the inaugural speaker, I guess the fate of your series lies in my hands now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm Monica Chaudhary. I have worked for Merkin Company, uh, which is the second largest pharmaceutical company in the world, for the last 21 years. And uh, 12 of those have been in the U.S. business, seven in a global role across the world about two years in MSD India. And as Kiran mentioned, I'm responsible for vaccines, uh, women's health, which is contraception, hormone replacement therapy, and fertility. And I also manage all the business support functions. Now, the reason why I suggested this as a topic is not because I'm an expert in this topic by any means. I've chosen the topic because uh, it's something that has started to affect our business. I see it particularly in the field of fertility. And what I also notice is that our sales uh, force and our marketing people initially were treating it as a one-off issue and trying to find one-off solutions to it. And because of the experience that I'd had in the US where I'd seen this happen in the early 90s, I wanted us as a team, and today with this dialogue for us as an industry, to recognize this trend and then really dialogue and develop a solution that will work for the betterment of our patients and to ensure that more people get good therapy. So again, I would request you to take this journey with me. I will simply raise a few issues and questions. I may not have the answers but I will certainly share with you whatever experiences I have had. So can I begin at the next slide, please? So very simply, I first wanted to just establish a definition of what I'm talking about when I say corporatization. I'm not suggesting that this is the Webster dictionary definition, but really what we're talking about is when you go from a, a healthcare owner provider situation to a situation where the healthcare is delivered in an organization which looks and operates more like a corporation. And what does that mean? It means that there is a formal management team that is running the company. There are multiple support departments like finance and marketing and legal that support the organization that the ownership of the company has multiple stakeholders. So it can either be privately held 
or it can be a publicly traded company. But either ways, the ownership is not necessarily highly restricted to one or two partners. In addition, it's a multi-centric operation which gives it the economies of scale. Now, inherent in the model is a standardization of processes and a quality of care. So if you think about any corporation, any company, as it grows larger and larger, all of this becomes germane to its very existence. So standardization, some standards of quality become very important. Now I've also added sort of an element of integrated healthcare delivery. Now that may or may not be true. So for example, when we're talking about healthcare delivery systems that are hospitals, um, there will be more integration of multiple delivery systems. But if it is a high specialized kind of care, there may not be integrated care. But let me take the example of fertility. If you are talking about an infertility organization, that is a corporatized organization as I call it, under that one roof, in addition to the IVF treatment, for example, you would also see counseling services possibly. Uh, you may see other diagnostic services. So even in highly specialized systems, it's a broader set of care that is delivered, not simply uh, segments of the care, if you will. So let's treat that as integrated uh, healthcare delivery. Um, again, inherently, as a result of achieving all of these things of standard processes, quality of care, I think technology and digital solutions uh, are become a, a, a key component of that delivery. And then finally, it is a for-profit entity. Okay, And the reason I particularly made that distinction is because at the bottom of the slide, you will see the WHO's definition of autonomization or corporatization. Now, that is not the corporatization we're talking about, where they're talking about taking public sector providers and making them behave a little bit more like a market-based organization so that, so that they can generate some pressure to improve performance. I want to be very clear that the rest of this organization, we are not talking about the government public sector or the WA, the World Bank, no, sorry, I, just, I think I said WHO, the World Bank's definition of corporatization. We're talking about Monica's definition of corporatization, which I um, listed above. So next slide, please, Karen. So let's just start with, a, with an overview of the healthcare sector. As you look at the slide on the left-hand side, um, as you look at your screen, you can see that the Indian healthcare sector is about $58 billion and it's growing at a CAGR of 15%. So first and foremost, as we go through this overview, let's identify those elements that would attract corporations to enter into this business. So what you have here is the beginning of the perfect recipe of a big business, a big healthcare sector, with a good CAGR of growth. In addition to that, what you will see is that the predictions of where this sector will reach in the future and the fact that as a percent of gross domestic product is going to grow from 5.5% to 8% suggests a very strong future. Now, this is not unlike any other emerging market and for those of our viewers who are, who are sort of doing this outside of India and is outside of the Indian economy, I would ask for you to look for similarities between this case study of India as a market and the markets of interest to you. So what you have is a strong segment for the corporates to be interested in and to play in. Now, interestingly, 85% of the current healthcare market is self-pay. It's out of pocket. This would not be a recipe for corporates to be interested in this market. However, the fact is that we have an insurance business that is budding and that gives us, I think we need to go one slide back here. 
We have an insurance, no, nope. we're good on this one. So we have an insurance market, uh, which is, which is, let's just put it that way. And let me break it up for you. Today, 26% of the lives in India are covered by insurance. But out of those 26%, 4% are in the private market and 22% are in covered by a government insurance system. So again, for our purposes today, I'm only going to talk about that 4% of lives that is in the private market that's covered by private insurers. That is expected to grow by 2.5% to about 10% by 2020. Now again, there are other emerging markets where this process of insurance coverage is moving far more rapidly. And I think that if, if as rapidly as that moves, the faster the corporatization will come because they're definitely positively uh, correlated with each other. The last bullet on the left-hand side is that of medical tourism. And again, that is a positive factor for corporates to want to enter into this, this marketplace because of a couple of things. First, because quality care will be valued, standard globalized care will be valued by the segment. And second, the price point that they would be willing to pay would be higher than the average price point in India and closer to the global price point. So that's another positive factor in this healthcare sector overview that supports corporatization. Now, you may or may not be able to see the, the, the chart on the right-hand side. At least for those of you that are my age, it's a little difficult for me to see. It. But the simple uh, sort of point that I want to make on this chart is that if you look at the $58 billion in the healthcare sector, 77% of it is in the delivery portion. 77% of that value comes from the delivery portion. And about 23% of the value comes from manufacturing. Now again, we'll leave manufacturing aside and focus on the healthcare delivery part of it. In the healthcare delivery part, you can see the different segments and it's not that important for us to go through those segments. But today, it is a highly fragmented, highly underserved market. And that is the last ingredient to the recipe for why corporatization will take roots and blossom very rapidly in the Indian healthcare delivery sector. Next slide, please. So just honing down further into the healthcare delivery system segment itself. So we move from the overall healthcare sector now into uh, the delivery market. Again, about $45 billion growing at a nice favor of 12%, and we expect it to continue uh, to grow at this way. Now, I've talked about medical tourism in the previous slide, and that has the potential right now of contributing, um, you know, about uh, 1.5 to $2 billion uh, in revenue, and we're talking about the very short term by uh, 2030. Now, um, there's a lot of growth in the hospital and diagnostic center and a lot of attraction to the foreign uh, direct investment in this segment. So about $1.34 billion worth of investment has come from abroad into this segment from uh, April 2000 to about March 2012, so over the 12-year period. Now again, foreign investment, corporatization, globalization, insurance coverage. These are all words that I want you to start tying together because these are the different dots that you need to connect to realize that corporatization is a way of life. It's here, it's going to stay, and it's only going to increase. The next slide. So visually speaking, we were trying to evoke sort of a picture of what this is like. And on the left-hand top corner, you will see what is the Indian equivalent of a mom and pop retail store, okay? The guy in the middle is your retailer, and he's covered every square inch of his retail space with his products. 
On the right hand side top corner, what you see is of course a modern organized retail space. We're saying that the evolution from the modern pop store to the organized retail space is analogous to what is happening to the owner proprietor driven healthcare delivery systems moving into the corporate healthcare delivery systems. And again, I mean no offense to any of my colleagues who are on the line who are themselves owner proprietor delivery care providers. Uh, that segment is here, it will stay. It will probably even be the predominant delivery mechanism for years to come. However, we do need to recognize that the trend on the right is also a growing trend. And now for those of us that are either providers, patients, vendors, pharmaceutical companies, all of us have to figure out how to live parallelly in both of these worlds. And I think we all know how to live on the left hand side of this slide. What we'll talk about is what do we need to do to operate successfully on the right hand side of the slide as we look at it. Next slide, please. So um, I tried to mention in the previous slides what were some of the drivers for corporations to enter into the healthcare segment. Here I've just summarized all of that into four succinct bullets. First and foremost, a huge unmet demand. Large market, growing market, huge unmet demand. Second, the fact that foreign investments are allowed, there's a very favorable policy by the government. And again, for those of you that are familiar with the Indian environment, there's a lot of controversy about direct foreign investment in other sectors of the economy. But when it comes to healthcare, the government has very favorable policies. Also, there has been a deregulation of insurance. And I talked earlier about the correlation between insurance and privatization. We talked a lot about medical tourism. I won't belabor that point. And the last point is, interestingly, from an investor perspective, whether you're a corporation that's investing, or you're a private equity funding company that's investing, the fact that there is strong profitability and EBITDA in this business makes it an attractive destination for investments. Now that's the corporate's driver for being interested in this market. What's in it for the physician provider? If you're a healthcare provider today and you graduate from medical school, when you come out, if you don't happen to be lucky enough to inherit an established delivery center, you're looking at a capital requirement to set up your own unit of about $120,000. And that is primarily driven by the high real estate costs. Now, add to that the fact that there are no guarantees of the patient pool, and you have no idea how long it will take you to read back your investment. Let's even say you're lucky enough to get all of that together. The maintenance, the upkeep of all the equipment, the facilities, trying to attract good manpower, develop them, retain them. And then every time you're out to negotiate any new equipment, to negotiate anything else related to your business, you lack the bargaining power as an individual. So the challenges to the sustenance, and if you want to scale up the business, the challenge to scaling it up, all of this again makes healthcare providers much more amenable to being part of a corporate setup rather than being on their own. I guess an analogy to that would be that I choose to work for work as a company instead of being an entrepreneur. So that would be the analogy. Now, what is in it for the consumers? Why are consumers uh, attracted to these corporate healthcare delivery setups? So from the patient's perspective, today in India and in all the emerging markets, we have a huge growing 
working class with more disposable income. And one of the areas where they want to spend that income is healthcare. So the expectation is that out of the total spending in India, healthcare will increase from about 7% to 9% by 2015. We also talked about the fact that private insurance will grow from 4% to 10%. We have increasing lifespans now. In fact, the longevity of life in India is now matching some of the uh, advanced emerging markets. And with the increasing lifespan, you have lifestyle diseases, hospitalizations and you need better quality of care as you age. Finally, with the economic progress that has happened, people are traveling, whether it is for work or for pleasure. They are seeing and becoming aware and aspiring for world-class medical services using state-of-the-art technologies and best-in-class personnel. So I can promise you um, that my father, uh, who is an American-trained radiologist, always thought that the U.S. was the place of destination if he ever needed a bypass surgery. And he will kill me if he knows that I, I put this on a webcast. But for the longest time, he had put money aside for his bypass surgery in the U.S. And I remember the day when he liquidated that account, saying, Monica, I can get my bypass surgery right here in India and it will be world class. So that just gives you a sense of the patients and what they're looking for today and the fact that the corporate delivery systems can give that to them. So we've talked about three stakeholders, the corporations themselves, the healthcare providers and the patients. So all of these people have some motivation to move towards, to be attracted towards a corporatized healthcare delivery system. Now, exactly where is this movement happening? See, depending on where you sit, you may or may not be exposed to it. So I'll give an example from my own business. If I have a fertility business, which is a very specialized business, I start to see the penetration of that into the fertility business. I also have the contraception business, and there you're getting more into the secondary care. So I'm not seeing as much penetration there yet, but I'm hearing the same people who have entered the tertiary specialized care businesses talking about creating women's health outlets. So you can see that even though today, the, move, the, the penetration is more in the hospital segment, the specialty segment, uh, in the tertiary segment of, this, of the care. There is already movement towards secondary care. And who knows, in the future also towards primary care. My hypothesis, and I am just hypothesizing, is that as you move from secondary care penetration into primary care penetration, even if you're talking about private corporatization, you'll start to see more and more models of public-private partnership. So again, just to orient you to the way that I'm looking at this slide on the left-hand side, when you look at the triangle, tertiary care is where there's penetration of private corporations today. Definitely in the hospital sector, which is very visible for everybody to see. And more in the specialized segments, which if you're affected by those segments, you this more than if you're not affected by them. Definite plans to move into the secondary sector. And probably in the future, a joint foray Public-private partnership into the primary sector. That is not to say that there aren't some sec some experiments already going on in the primary sector. Now, what you see on the right-hand side of the slide, as you are looking at it, is all the allied services in which there's already been a penetration 
of the corporate uh, organizations. So whether it is diagnostic labs, whether it is pharmacies, um, ambulatory services, etc., you can already see the impact uh, and a fair amount of impact into the allied services. So that's sort of um, you know a little bit of uh, an overview of where we see uh, corporatization happen and where it will go uh, into the future. So um, if you are a stakeholder today, what are the positive benefits to each of the stakeholders of this movement in corporatization? If you're a delivery provider, you're a single owner proprietary sort of provider, you already have a unit, and you go ahead and participate in corporatization. Let's say you join a corporate organization in whatever kind of ownership uh, sharing uh, arrangement. What you get immediately, of course, is the greater investment, the ability to provide better care and more be competitive. You also can eradicate some of the inefficiencies by looking at standardized care protocols, which and likely will come from some global um, sort of uh, organization or, or, or some accepted standards of, of care. Um, you can also take that global um, sort of standards but also be able to customize them to your local and regional requirements. So it's sort of a best of both worlds. If you're a physician, you get the opportunity to belong to a big banner organization. You get access to better facilities better patient care. Um, there are very clear quality objectives and goals. Um, and you're also bound to some kind of profit maximization and growth of the unit that you're associated with. So it's not like being an employee in some way. Patients, we already talked about it, clean, efficient, hygienic, uh, specialized, uh, standardized care. Also, what we see the corporatization, and particularly if it's combined with strong insurance penetration, is the growth of the wellness business. That more and more emphasis on prevention as opposed to cure. So those are some of the positive benefits. But no coin has one side. So I've tried to outline the risks, and again, I did that at the risk of offending certain stakeholders. But Let's do some fair balance. So next slide, please. So here are some potential risks. And again, this is Monica's perspective. This is not, um, you know, sort of carved in stone or black and white. So clearly, one of the pressures for the corporates is this content, constant of their, uh, of their certifications, the audits that are involved, the cost pressures, etc. cetera. And, and that has its own sort of sequelae effect. Uh, also, uh, you um, have the additional risk of sort of medical, um, you know, um, suits, lawsuits against the organization because it's uh, it's easier for a consumer to sue an organization or a corporation maybe than it is to sue an individual proprietor. So again, this is certainly not my area of expertise. I'm just trying to put a point of view. Certainly would love to have some questions debates, discussions, or just comments on, on the potential risks. For the physicians, I think some of the discontent comes from the fact that they now have targets, um, and uh, that sometimes they feel that the patient-doctor relationship is compromised, because if they belong to a large corporate organization, they're seen, it becomes more of a seller-consumer relationship. And again, these are all open to debate. And then for the patient, uh, some of the comments that come back are, you know, yes, it's nice to have super specialized care, but is it all really necessary uh, or is there additional care given because of profit motivations? So again, like I said, I wanted to present both sides, the positives and potentially the negatives or the risks of corporatizations to um, the different stakeholders. As I said in the beginning, I'm not an expert on this topic. I simply wanted to raise the, the, the uh, subject for discussion. So this is sort of where I've laid the landscape to the best of my ability to start a dialogue. What I will share with you in the next slide is a couple of sort of 
morphing of the original model. So the original model was, you know, get into the hospital business or get into some super specialized business, whether it's day surgeries or it's fertility or, um, you know, it's dialysis clinics or whatever it is. Corporations got into it and quite a few of the early movers sort of got burned with those models. And that is not unusual in any kind of innovation. And now they have evolved into certain other models. Again, some of it is experimentation, some of it more established as time has gone along. I'm sharing with you a couple of the models. The first two that I've described here are more specific to the channel of the care delivery. And the next ones are about type of delivery, type of care. So let me explain what I mean by that. So what the first one, which, is, which talks about retail healthcare, talks about bringing primary basic medical care centers into retail outlets for easy access and convenience for the patient. Okay. So it's not talking specifically about what type of care. It has to, by nature, be primary care. But it's more the outlet or the distribution channel, if you will, of the care. And similarly, the second concept talks about medical malls, which is really, uh, you know, sort of different specialties under one in location, again, to provide accessibility and greater depth of services. Now, the next few talk about the types of care. So daycare surgery is one that we see uh, fairly often um, that allows patients to come in and sort of uh, outpatient surgeries done in better ambience, greater patient satisfaction, more cost-effective way, and standardized care. And Kiran and I can share a story with you about this. Uh, we were driving from the airport uh, to the facility where the webcast is taking place. And of course, we were having a conversation about this session, um, and we did not realize that the, doc uh, the, the chauffeur uh, was overhearing the conversation, which obviously close space he could not avoid and interestingly he chimed in and told us that he had had it was a kidney surgery right Kira? Okay. Hernia. Hernia, hernia, hernia. I'm sorry. it was a hernia surgery and he said he had a wonderful experience in one of these daycare surgeries that we were passing by he said it was a fabulous experience I checked in in the morning I was done by four o'clock it cost me X amount of money and at least two or three times, he mentioned the fact that he had had a very positive experience with the, the surgery. So, so it was like a life testimonial to, to drive uh, you know, in, on the drive here. Um, in addition to the daycare surgeries, you also have a couple of other facilities. And that one of them is, of course, assisted living. Now, again, um, for those of you that are in uh, economies uh, that are in the Western world, uh, this has very much been a part of society for many, many decades, but certainly one that we are seeing now. And I have, again, parents who are in their 70s, and a lot of their friends are, are taking advantage of these assisted living facilities. There are rehabilitation centers. There are also single specialty clinics, uh, I mean, sorry, single specialty hospitals, um, the maternity care, as I mentioned. And I will again tell you, it's just my experience, but the penetration into the maternity care has not yet occurred to the level that one would have expected. And I wonder whether there is a little bit of a learning there where that one-on-one -on -one relationship with a specific doctor uh, has anything to do with it. And again, I don't know the answer, but maternity care, I have not seen as much penetration as I have seen, for example, in fertility. And then last, of course, the boutique health centers, which sort of border even outside of health into beauty and wellness. So uh, we won't discuss that one in detail. So these are the emerging market innovation models that are happening. A little bit, again, of a glimpse into the future. What does the future hold? And again, this is simply a conversation starter. I've randomly picked four different organizations and shared with you sort of what their plans are, and these are, of course, publicly available information, um, what their plans are as they go into the future. And Apollo is a big hospital chain in India. 
Um, they have plans to buy out a partner who has a stake um, in Bangalore. Uh, you can look at the amounts and the investments, make your own judgment about how big or small they are. They're talking about investing in increasing the number of beds. Today they have 8,500 beds. They're talking about 11,500 beds, uh, nearly a 33% increase by 2014, and plans of buying, uh, of developing a new hospital. By the way, uh, one thing that I did not mention earlier in this discussion is whenever you talk to the corporates, there is always um, a balance that they keep between what they call greenfield uh, investments, where they build the, the setup from scratch, and brownfield investments, where they purchase an existing facility and then, of course, morph it to uh, any standards that, that they may be following. Fortis Hospital, again, competitors with Apollo, uh, same thing, uh, investing in robotic surgery uh, so that, you know, again, now you see that that super specialization investments happening, which an individual owner proprietor may find difficult to invest in. And of course, planning to increase the number of centers by six to 10 centers, and, uh, additional centers by 2013. Um, Thyrocare, very specialized diagnostic organization that uh, was focused on thyroid-related diagnostics, processing about half a million samples a day. They now plan to expand in other uh, diagnostic areas and, and into radiology and oncology sector as well. Um, for those of you that are familiar, 8.4 is the pharmacy chain. I presume all of you know that that is the body temperature, so if you're checking to see whether you have a fever or not, you know, I guess that is the genesis of, of the name. Um, 300 stores today in India and introducing not only healthcare products, but of course, personal care products. So um, all kinds of things happening in the future. And I've simply brought up the discussion, shared a few views, points, thoughts. So here's my question to all of you, and this is my closing statement to you. Corporatization is coming. Whether we like it or not, it's coming. The question is, whoever you are, whatever segment of healthcare you're in, are you ready for it? And let me tell you a little bit of a personal experience. So in our own business, as I mentioned to you, we see this trend coming into our business for fertility. We're interested in the infertility uh, segment. We have products in that segment. I certainly won't pitch for our products in this forum. Um, but what we found is we were getting from our field messages saying, you know, we're seeing this chain coming up, we're seeing that chain coming up, but yet our salespeople were still interacting with the individual physician providers. And that's when we sat back and we said, wait, let's not treat this as one-off things. Let's really take a view as to how we can work in conjunction with these organizations. What can we do to improve the quality of care in this area, to improve their business, and to improve our business. And so I'll share sort of what our plans are in three categories. One, we have to be prepared for the cost pressures that will come with organized large-scale purchasing. There is no walking away from that. And I can tell you from my experience in the early 90s, uh, when our own company had a one-price policy, and the insurance companies came in, the PBMs came in, they had negotiating power, and we learned our lesson with some loss to the business initially. So in the emerging markets, as these trends come, we don't have to relearn those lessons. Let's be prepared. Let's be prepared to understand that these organizations do have negotiating power. How are we going to negotiate for volumes for market shares so that our profitability is maintained. So that's the first area that we're looking at. The second area is that these organizations and we as a business 
have one common interest, which is quality of care, standard protocols, the delivery of good care and successful patient outcome. And that's where we can collaborate. So we're certainly looking at ways to partner holistically across healthcare providers, in even until the patient level, to see what we can do to improve quality of care. And then lastly, we have to retrain and retool our manpower. Today, we have individual sales representatives who call on individual physicians. Going forward, we will not only need an account management approach where one account manager works with the central organization to rapidly disseminate sort of standard protocols throughout the different outlets of care. But more importantly, we need a team that is working with the account of medical practitioners, uh, of our own medical staff, along with our account people, along with our marketing people, so that we can develop medical marketing um, plans with our partners and we have an account management approach to them rather than simply a one-on-one -on -one sort of negotiating a once a year kind of approach to the organization. So those are just a few of my thoughts and comments here. I hope um, that I have shared with you uh, sort of uh, my learnings and I, I would love to encourage people uh, to share their thoughts and ask us any questions that they might have. Thank you, Monica. I think the I think the presentation was uh, was fantastic and very insightful. We've reached uh, the Q and A section of our uh, session. We invite participants to send us your questions. I have a, a few here, uh, but let's pause for a minute and allow people to submit their questions. Again, if you'd like to submit a question, please look at the bottom left hand side of your screen. There's a text box there. You can type in your question and uh, we'll begin to start answering questions in the next uh, minute or so. So I think uh, what you were talking about, uh, how your experience in the US mm -hmm. and how it's going to translate here, I think the audience might be interested in knowing how do we orchestrate the change in a systematic manner yes. so that the balance of power doesn't fall overtly on one side of the of the fence. Do you have thoughts on how that could be done? So, so Karen, I think that's an excellent question, and and that's really uh, a key reason why I wanted to do this this uh, this talk today. Um, I think that first and foremost, a lot of these organizations are themselves trying to find their feet, and so if and I'll speak from a pharma uh, company perspective. Um, if there are other uh, sort of people who are in different segments of the healthcare in, um, um, business, please let us know so we can customize it to your needs. But um, you know, if you're talking about the pharmaceutical companies, work with uh, the corporations today. They want to partner with you. They'd like to know how you can help in the quality of improving the quality of care. What they can do. Okay, so I think like in any interaction, uh, if you are there partnering from the beginning. Uh, you will be seen as a long-term value partner. So I think it's very important um, that you know you start off with that perspective. The second thing is don't go in with an antagonistic us versus them. All they want is a low price kind of mindset. Okay? Because let's be honest, then they could turn around and say all you want is more business. But if we agree that we have some common ground and we're trying to optimize the solution for both parties, I think that mental model is very important. And then the last thing, like I said, move it from sales, um, you know, a, a kind of a sales mindset, take your medical department in these discussions. It is very important, and that's why I try to characterize what is common in these corporatized healthcare organizations, because quality of care, standardization of care, outcomes, this is used by them to market their facilities. They are themselves in fierce competition. So if you can help them with those things, you will not be able to do that without involving your medical department and not on a one-off basis, but really as partners that are walking step, uh, you know, step to step with you. Correct. I think uh, that sort of feeds into to my next question. Do you think there's a secret sauce here? 
Do you think that, in, and this is probably the billion dollar question that yes. you result in that, all of that us. That you want uh, me to share on a yeah. webcast across the world. <laughs> I think this is the Bahamas question, right? So if, you, if people had an answer, you'd be all of the Bahamas. But do you think that there are certain things that, uh, you know, since India is at, uh, at that time and place where we get the opportunity to do it yes. right and do it right correctly yeah. the first yeah. time? Yes. I, I think, uh, I, I think I'll answer your question a little differently, Kiran. Uh, what excites me about the corporatization process is that the quality of care, the number of people that will get better care, and as I said, in the future, if it evolves into a, a, a public-private partnership, the penetration into the pyramid, lower and lower socioeconomic strata of the pyramid, is the exciting part about this. And no matter who you are in this whole sort of setup, see the excitement and the opportunity of getting better care, better care, world-class care, to the Indian patient. And depending on where you are, to the Singaporean patient or to the Korean patient or you know wherever you are, uh, whatever country. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to really improve um, the lives of patients. And, and when I, I shouldn't even say patients because so much of it will also be about wellness. Correct. So it will improve the quality of life. And that's, uh, that's the secret sauce because yeah. that should give you the high to collaborate across segments. And I think, I forget who mentioned this to me, but they were talking about, you have to forgive me, I forget who mentioned it. Uh, we, they were talking about the fact that they have uh, attracted uh, somebody from the private insurance company. Was it you or, or, or maybe it was Gaurav who mentioned it? Um, that that some, they attracted somebody from the private insurance business and they said today the insurers, the corporations that are in the healthcare delivery systems, the pharma companies, they're all working in their own silos Correct. and almost competing with each other instead of working collaboratively to see how we can optimize care and as a result of that, optimize our business lives. Correct. I think uh, you know, this fits very nicely into why healthcare at a very philosophical level, why it kind of start, right? Putting the patient in the middle of the healthcare system. I think that realignment in, in many forms is beginning to happen through corporate initiatives, through governments yes. launching programs, things like that. Yes. So I think putting the patient back in the center of the Absolutely. system, I think that's the secret. Absolutely, part. you said it. I have to quote um, a president of Merck in the 1950s. He was on the uh, on the cover of Time magazine. His name uh, was George Merck. And his famous quote is, and it's the ethos of the company, it is that medicine is for the patients, not for profit. The more that we have remembered that medicine is for the patients, the profits have never failed to appear. Okay. So I, I think you're absolutely right. We've got some interesting questions coming from all over the place. Yes. We've got one from Vietnam. Yes. I, I, I hope that I pronounce your name correctly. I apologize if I don't. Uh, we've got a question from Tran Du Dong. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the public sector has been responding to the advent of the rise in corporatization? Have we started seeing any operational efficiencies in their functions? So, so I think what he's sort of hinting at is we see a lot of corporatization yes. slightly more skewed to the private sector. Yes. But do you see the public sector kind of taking notice and, and making those changes? Yes. So, so I'll, t I'll tell you, I see a couple of trends and I focus on the hospital segment a little bit. And I, again, I'm talking about India, uh, but I could apply uh, just as much to any emerging market. Um, there's one positive trend and one negative trend. Uh, the, the positive trend that I see is that more and more uh, the hospitals are looking to get into a hub and spoke model. And what that means is that the big hub uh, uh, institution is in the big metro cities, but the spokes are in smaller and smaller towns. Now, as they do that, they're going to have to tap into the lower socioeconomic strata. From the other side, I mentioned to you that we expect 45% of the lives in India to be covered by some form of insurance, and 35% of them will be under will be insured by the government. So if you merge these two trends, geographic trend of the penetration of corporate hospitals into the, the tier two, tier three, and further cities, and the government insurance part of it, it won't take long for them to come together to some kind of agreement. 
Okay, so that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it, which I find a little bit troubling, um, is that there is actually a forced requirement uh, for corporate hospitals to keep a certain percentage of their beds reserved for the lower income patients. Now, philosophically uh, and socially, I'm very aligned with that. Unfortunately, when it comes to practical implementation, it has fairly negative consequences, both for the patient when they try to get the care, and I've seen in the US for the hospitals when they, they, they get into a situation where they cannot balance their paying patients to their non-paying patients, the hospitals then become losing business propositions. So I see that as a little bit of a worrisome trend, mm -hmm. and we need to, to find that balance so that the corporate hospitals, and again, I'm just using hospitals, this can be any uh, okay. corporatized care, they can find that, that happy balance because at the end of the day, Healthcare is more than a business. It's, it's fundamentally and primarily first a social responsibility. Correct. So how do you balance that with profits and how does the government partner with the corporations as opposed to forcing something in? That Those are the pushes and the pulls. I see. But I, I think uh, there's another very interesting question here and I'm going to pick this out. Uh, so we have a question from Delhi and uh, this, this gentleman Vikram asks that is there a role of value-based care? Do you think, uh, like how you get to see in the US, yes. this, the, the ecosystem is built in, in such a way that now there's a pull and push, yes. right? And now, um, for example, on the insurance side, they want to incentivize based on best practice, mm. right? So they want to remove certain financial barriers from people consuming certain drugs in order to keep them healthy, make sure that they are adhere and yes. things like that. Yes. Do you think that the same ecosystem, corporatization is really that key lever that can help um, you know, promote value-based care here in India. Yes. So, Vikram, I'm going to ask a favor of you. If you can quickly type us a message about whether you're talking about cost-effectiveness data and value-based from that perspective, or you're talking about even a more sophisticated model where you pay for the level of service received. So, you know, it's, it's almost like, yes. Correct. Yes. So, so, so just drop us a quick quick message on that. But the short answer to that is that corporatization will rapidly take us along the path of value-based cost effectiveness analyses uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is a very business oriented reason, which is that these organizations will have to today and will more so in the future have to justify to the insurance companies Correct. the prices that they're charging. Exactly. Okay, so that's one. Um, and the second is that, um, you know, they also have to uh, publish and present scientific data that suggests how they're moving healthcare forward in order to, again, for their marketing purposes, to build their image in the community, to build their image globally. So a lot of this kind of work is highly encouraged in the corporate hospitals. Okay. And finally, because they have the resources to do it. I think what's really encouraging, Monica, is that you can really see the trend from healthcare being transactional to becoming slightly more about the journey. Yes. Right, more yes. holistic, and then all these different entities corporatizing, I yes. quote that. Yes. Uh, I think that's going to help uh, enable this whole change. Yes. And I'll, I'll tell you what, Ken, I think the, the one additional part is, you know, let's make no mistakes. There were, there were, there are, and there will be in the future individual operator providers. And quite a fair number of them are superb at what they do, okay? What corporatization does is it raises the average. Okay. It brings everybody up to a certain standard instead of having sort of this, skew. you know, skew. Correct. Okay, I mean, that that's really the best way to simplify. Because I don't want to make it sound like in the old system we didn't have good doctors or we didn't have good practices. But we had a lot of variation. What right. this will do is more standardization, more ex acceptance of a minimum that will be sort of standard for you. Correct. We have an interesting question um, about India and the and the need for uh, for resources that, that unmet need that you talked about earlier on in your presentation. Yes. And how the private sector is ideally positioned to meet that need, which is why we've kind of seen some of that traction here. Yes. Uh, I, I think. 
what the person Vipa Tanupriya from Bangalore, what she yes. says is, uh, it's still a really small percentage. I yes. she's beginning to say, hey, will this really, will there be a day sometime yes. in the near future when yes. we'll actually see yes. healthcare reach everywhere it's supposed to be? Yes. So, so Danupriya, uh, you've, you've tapped into an issue that's very close to my heart and not a topic of discussion today, but I'll deviate for a minute. Uh, we've actually, as I mentioned to you, I'm involved in contraception. I'm also involved in vaccines and we have a vaccine uh, for the prevention of cervical cancer. And I mentioned those specifically because those really start to touch into areas where you want to get mass reach. It's your social, moral, business um, responsibility uh, to try and get as deep into the pyramid as you can. And we've had a lot of interactions and we actually divide the socioeconomic pyramid into three groups. What we've discussed today is sort of the high income private group. What it is going to improve also in the future is the bottom group that is served by the government that we call the income public sector and the government has huge plans you know that they're tripling investment in the healthcare sector infrastructure etc so i think we can expect to see great improvement even in the bottom segment i think the one that is underserved mm -hmm. that we have to figure out how this corporatization penetrates is that middle income private segment and I have to say, Kiran, today, when that chauffeur told me that he got that surgery, we are getting there. Are getting there. I, I can only, it's as anecdotal and it's less than 12 hours fresh, yeah. but it just gave me a real hope that we are getting there. So, Tanupriya, depending on whether you see a glass half full or half empty, um, the answer is yours to decipher. I think at that we've uh, unfortunately run out of time. Uh, so, I'd like to thank Monica for for coming down and, and, and driving this session. I'm sure all the participants have uh, loved your insight. It was an excellent presentation. Um, why we couldn't have, couldn't answer all the questions that came in, what we will definitely do is uh, get back to each of you all. So Monica, you can expect some questions coming up. Uh, and we'll get back to you soon. This webcast will also be available offline in, in about a week. Uh, so we we'll definitely send a link out to everyone that joined us today. I'd like to thank all of you all for being a part of the first series of um, expert sessions as part of Pharma Future this year and look forward to joining um, you on, on the others that we will do uh, in the next couple of months. Thank you very much. Thanks, Monica. You're most welcome.